um, I'll be seeing company, new companies come up, and I'm like, all right, wh why is it that your editors are not diverse? Like, it's it's all over the place, right? I think big companies like Marvel and DC and like even Image to a degree, they might have diversity on the page, but it's not reflected by who's creating it, right? Where are the women of color, right? Where are the, the, the queer women? Where are the trans women? Like, where, where are the, like, generally just trans people and queer people? Like, where are these people who are also creating it, right? Because the, the, the people behind the scenes are just as important as people on the page, right? You still have the, the, the status quo essentially going, all right, all right, I'm gonna make the world look like it, like it actually does but it's only from their perspective. It's still a very narrow story, right? I think it's the mainstream comics, and the, if we're not including like indie comics or, or, or comics from even like book imprints and things like that, that to a degree are also mainstream, your direct-to-market comics, you're kind of slow now. Like the train is really moving fast on inclusivity. Go get creators who are people who are making fantastic work online. Hurry up and get them behind the page, right? It's taking too long at this point. Like now we're in 2019. No, like now we need to we gotta keep. Like it's 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 not enough that like like how am I ever gonna get to Young and Dundas if I'm taking like an inch towards it, right? It's we need to move faster in, in, in the in including people behind the page. Uh, I think we need to be able to not only do that, but don't rely on the direct comic. Of books as well, right? Miss Marvel's great, Miss Marvel's not enough, right? We need to move on and look at really great books by like Jen Wang, who did The Prince and the Dressmaker, which is a fantastic book that you should check out. But yeah. Good. Like white male creators have been writing identity 
politics stories for a billion years, and nobody questions that, and it's seen as bravery, and it's seen as really edgy. And then when marginalized writers do it, it's like, this is just focused on identity politics. And it's like, no, I'm just telling a story the same way that everybody else is telling a story. So I think we need to stop like pigeonholing marginalized artists and like um, creating these little spots of like, oh, like we want to see like uh, like a trans artist make a comic, but it has to specifically be about their struggles as a trans person. They can't just make a comic about like being a trans superhero and just being awesome. Like if me as a Muslim woman, if I want to write a story about like I don't know oppression or something. My homeland, all these sad stories. People are like, oh yeah, this is great. But I'm not trying to write about that. I'm trying to write about me uh, just growing up as a Muslim teen here and being like really awkward weird. Mm -hmm. um, like any teen story. Like any teen be, story, yeah. except that I'm except, yeah, Muslim around. Yeah. So we have a tendency to only want to hear marginalized creators when they're talking about these really heavy things. We don't allow them to like, tell stories of joy, or we don't allow them to exist in stories just as they are, as like default characters. They're sort of this like special extra character. And when we do that, we're basically telling marginalized creator, there are only certain stories that you can tell. And you're not allowed to tell any others. And you can only tell these stories to make the publishing uh, look good, basically, which I think is really gross. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, I want to turn it over for some questions from the audience, but before I do that, to sort of wrap our side up a little bit, um, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, although I told some of you that I was going to ask you some lessons. Um, uh, I want to ask you, you can choose from whatever angle you want here, what's one or two of your favorite comics that you've either recently read or you've read in the past that you, like, in terms of like a recommend, not a recommendation, I don't want to put it in that frame, but something that, that a comic that really stands out to you um, as being really important to you and the kind of uh, work that you do, or alternatively, what's something that's really exciting that you're seeing in the in the comics uh, in comics and in the comics industry? I just read Redlands. Um, it was really cool. It was recommended by a friend, and it was just so beautiful. Like just visually, it looks gorgeous. It was really graphic. It freaked me out a lot of work, but. Um, just the artistry of that really spoke to me. Um, I think some more of like a geeky level. Um, I became like really, really obsessed with American Vampire when it first came out. And I've, I've just been waiting for a long time for like, I think Volume 8 to come out. It's like never going to happen. Because um, like Scott Steiner is like the back and stuff. Um, but those are like really special comics to me. And I can't even say why maybe girls who really like Spider-Man, <laughs> <laughs> which, like, I, I'm, I'll admit that, I, I just do. <laughs> the 90s were a good time for us. Yeah, like, I, I just really liked that, and I, I thought it was really cool, and I dressed up as, like, Pearl Jones for Halloween, and, like, no one knew who it was, and, um, and yeah, so that's what I would say. Um, yeah, I Dressmaker by Jen Wang from Per Second. Fantastic book. Uh, it will. Uh, Hori Mia, which is from Yen Press, is a manga that is fantastic. It's a contemporary uh, slow burn slice of life um, comic uh, about teens doing teen things. It's so adorable. Uh, it's by Hiro and Daisuke Harigawa, I think. Uh, hope I got that right. And. Uh, I also really enjoyed the Moonshot Indigenous Comics anthology. Yeah. Um, first one or the second one? The, I have the second one. I have yet to read it. But the first one is great. Both have art that literally just knocks the wind out of you. It is gorgeous. And they're all different styles, but they all equally just do amazing things. Great. So I'd recommend that. In terms of what comics is doing, that's really great. Again, I love young reading about young people. Um, so. It's really great to see these uh, different publishers dedicating their space to all ages comics. Um, so I know DC has a middle grade and a white imprint, 
Uh, but just generally speaking, a lot of publishers are, are doing that, which is great. Um, and it's really great to see those stories come out. We were talking a lot about like comics without any like, dialogue or words and stuff. So <clears throat> a couple of things that I've really enjoyed over the years have actually been beating a lot of pros lately. Burn out, I think, of comics. Anyways, but um, there's a series uh, of books from Magnetic Press um, called, the first one's Love the Tiger, and they are stunning. They are told, like, with no dialogue, but they're from the perspective of these animals. So it's like a day in the life of this tiger that's just trying to survive in the jungle. And it's this stunning tale, like, it's comic form, and uh, just goes through what he has to do to survive. And they also have, I think, Love the Fox and Love the Dinosaur. So for those of you who are like into dinosaurs and stuff, like, you know, they don't have to be read in any particular order. They are fantastic, though. The art is just brilliant. Um, and then from No Brow Press, there's another book um, called uh, Night Lights by Lorena Alvarez. So good. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> like, they just have like these, she has these spreads and like just like it's you can't stop staring at it for like forever it's like what you said like you like look up and it's like spring it's a completely different season like it's so stunning the colors are this is it hey this is good but they're so beautiful <laughs> just like looking now but they can't see it so much. yeah it's i know i know but i'm trying to be more about age i know what i'm doing <laughs> like it's incredible um, and it's a really short read, which again, you know, you spend, you spend like a year doing that, but it's beautiful. Uh, I just read Cardboard Kingdom by Chad Sill. Uh, Chad Sill? Sill? Yeah, okay. Chad Sill. Fantastic. It's very animated, uh, focuses on 16 different kids in this one neighborhood, very imaginative, every single one of them, and they are like, they, they play their own, like, like role like D and D characters without like the D and D like like they 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 design their own costumes out of cardboard and they play in each other's backyards where each backyard is a different layer of uh, or like this different theme um, environment uh, yeah just a lot of fun so much fun and it's, and it's like there's it's a lot of like short stories that focuses on each uh, of the sixteen kids so you. you you grow to love every single one of them and, and how they interact with each other. I think there's different like, writers for the different stories too in some of them. So yeah, or a different writer or a different artist. Yeah, yeah, or yeah, 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 something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. This is kind of the worst of my work is on the spot. Um, <laughs> so I'm sorry for all the wonderful people whose work I've ever had recently and I can't remember now. But uh, one that springs to mind as more body work, not just uh, single single works, single books and comics, is um, Lauren Galloway, who's an artist working in Chicago, and she just recently has been making work uh, sort of quickly and along with her like experiences that are they're just like crushing it. It's this beautiful metaphor of a book that had like um, has like moons starting like one moon on one side of the book and one moon at the end of the book and it's like a, a do -si do that you like flip to read one story and then flip it to start reading the other story and they like collide in the middle and it's the estrangement from her brother and it just like totally blew my mind. And stories about motherhood that I think are really, um, are really interesting, especially when we try to combine motherhood and comics in the amount of time we have to it takes and, and what kind of effort you can put there. She just has such a like philosophical and nuanced way of showing what's just really happening in her life. And yeah, it's just precious. Wonderful. Yeah. On the spot? <laughs> <laughs> Second, you ask a question like I've never read a comic book in my life. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, if the intent of the question is let's let's give people some, some good comics to read, um, my answer would be you're surrounded by them right here. And just looking at the shelf before they start is not a book on that shelf that I said, there's no reason for this book to be here. This is a bad comic. So <laughs> <laughs> you can't go wrong. <laughs> Uh, 
you guys ever read your comics after you finish them? Yeah, I, I recently, there's a comic I did for a company that since went bankrupt. And uh, a couple years gone by, I remember that comic was really, really good. It was such a good comic. And I found someone who was illegally pirated, and I downloaded my own comic. <laughs> I read it, and it was not as good as I thought. It was really disappointing, because I thought it was, um, it was such a shame they reflected in the book, and now I'm like, I'm kind of glad no one can read this. <laughs> um, but when I'm writing, the experience is, uh, the only way I can tell if what I've read is good is to imagine reading it. It's to literally read it and imagine what it looks like on the page. And so you're always your own first reader. And uh, I guess what, what what crushed me from that other experience is that I thought I was a good first reader, but now I know I'm biased. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think we all, you, all read, you, you read your stuff when you're writing it. Sure it's... I think I've gone back and like read some of the things like I wrote earlier and like, I, I think I always have anxiety about like handing something in and just like, ooh, it's terrible. And then I'm like, no, no, it's good, it's fine. And I'm like, okay, 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 okay. Um, or like, if you want like a really honest editor, like Hope Nicholson, like you hand in a book and you're like, how was my story? She's like, you know, like it was a solid B. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, thanks. Well, that's fine. Um, she does. She, she did that to me. That's a true story. Like, trying to get it to maybe bring it to a B plus. No, they had already been published at this point. I'm just like, Margaret Atwood, so I'm just like, cool, 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 that's not a big deal. She's like, no, don't worry, it's fine, it's a solid B. So that was like her, like, reaffirming. <laughs> I'm like, I'm okay with that, because, you know, like, she's honest, and I'm like, I knew it wasn't, like, an amazing story, so I can, I can appreciate that she's, like, blunt about that, but also, you're like, oh, okay. Because sometimes people will like 
you know, I'm, in, I'm doing an interview and they ask me about some part of the book and I'm like, I don't remember that part. <laughs> I have to go read it. And it is the same kind of feeling of like, oh wow, I did that. Okay, yeah, that's how I did it before and oh, I would do it differently now and there's so much in this process, but also like, really trying hard to appreciate when something is done and what an achievement that was for me personally, no matter how it sits in the spectrum of all good comics or even my taste. Um, so yeah, I do it sometimes just to like refresh my mind that I've done this, I can do it again. I did it one way and I can do it other ways. And I'm learning how to deal with the embarrassment of this thing <laughs> that I don't necessarily like all the time being out there. <laughs>
orange stickers for black indigenous and color cartoonists. Um, we have green stickers for mental health comics, and we have blue stickers for physical health comics. And that's within the subject, so they're not segregated from their subject area, but you can still look up at the shelf and you can see these stickers in all categories. So that, uh, yeah, so we, we do have that in mind, and we are looking for ways to improve upon that as well. And a note on like YA maturity and stuff. Um, yeah, obviously we don't want like violence or hatred or like uh, uncommunity or something like that. But these are things that young adults are exposed to every day as well. So we want to uh, give young adults respect and, and still include those narratives. Um, and I think the kids and young adults are good at self-censoring as well, so if they pick something up and uh, they don't feel like they're quite ready for it, um, in my experience, um, working in bookstores and libraries, uh, they tend to put it back on the shelf. Um, yeah, so I think that answers the question. And there's some great uh, narratives for YA that have been challenged as well, like uh, like uh, this one, Summer, uh, and uh, by Dillian and Mariko Tamaki and Skim as well by the cousins and uh, they contain very relatable stories um, and you know there's themes like queerness that for some reason like they've been on banned books lists and stuff but these are everyday experiences so so yeah that that's very important to me and how we're trying to organize books in our collection. Great. <laughs> Maybe one more question if there is one to wrap it up. Yep. Um, I. One of the things I love about comics is the medium or an art form, however we're raising it now, um, is I feel like it has a really unique uh, ability to deal with time that is not the same as film or literature or visual art or prose or poetry. Um, so I don't know, I just wondered if anybody kind of wanted to speak to that. like. Uh, for me, it's particularly interesting kind of the intersection of like passage of time and memory um, in relation to our wild kind of stuff, but it's so important in any kind of story. Like the, I know Scott McLeod and possibly Ryan have talked about this in their, um, in their talks, like uh, how you know one page can be just like literally one second, or it can be a year or a decade um, or a century on a page. Um, so yeah, I don't know if anybody wanted to to how time is relevant. I like the, the flexibility comments I think you're speaking about, the flexibility of time. Uh, there's a guy on Twitter this morning who I had said that um, there's a joke in this world about how you know, Ghost Rider doesn't ride on ghosts, but Silver Surfer is a silver guy who surfs. He's <laughs> <laughs> funny, like, you know, has it actually been shown that he's silver, and wouldn't he have to polish himself a lot? <laughs> And I said, oh, well, that's the beauty of comics, is that between every panel, there's time for him to quickly polish himself. Yeah. <laughs> that's what the Silver Surfer is doing. And I felt like, I just declared that kid. <laughs> and like, that, that, that space between the panels and gutters is such a flexible thing. There's so much fun there. You know, that You're going to like get an email after this from Marvel that's like, we want to write like, you know, like Hawkeye, but like, the Silver Surfer had off time. Like, what is the deal?
kind of comics that I've seen in the kind of field would find it interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I like when some comics like are able to tell like three stories all at once. We're like, you see, but like yeah, they're, they're, they're segmented like three different stories and so and they would use maybe like it would be like the characters or the the, the color schemes that would tie in the panels that that connect to like that one thread of, of the three threads which is kind of cool uh, I, I tried to play around with I, I did an experiment with that one time when I was doing like this this little fan comic of uh, this Marvel character named Multiple Man and he, he like his, his powers he, he can uh, duplicate himself. So I thought wouldn't it be fun to like for like this one heist like follow three of them uh, but make sure it's clear for the readers that they can go any path they want and it comes to the same ending uh, which is kind of neat. Uh, we're concluded. Thank you very much, and thank you to you folks up here on the panel. Uh, thanks for being here, and before you leave, also. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so first of all, thank you. That was a wonderful conversation. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, um, I, I hope you uh, caught a glimpse today of what we're trying to do. Um, I'm not sure how much research everyone has done before coming here today, but we are a nonprofit. Uh, we're completely volunteer run right now. Um, we rely uh, mostly on donations and volunteer work, and we're hoping to make this sustainable. So uh, this is a pop-up library. Uh, we have officially launched our crowdfunding campaign as of a minute ago. <laughs> so uh, we have uh, information on where you can find that on our website, on our blog, on our, all our social media. Um, so yeah, it'll be a 30-day campaign and we're trying to raise money to be able to rent a physical location and have this and you continue to have these amazing conversations um, ongoing and to have workshops as well. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Um, What's the website, Rochin? And there's a short donation.